One of the really wonderful parts, uh, Gary mentioned the Stonyfield Institute, which was a program that, that Gary and Michael Swack uh, collaborated on over many, many years. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity for aspiring entrepreneurs to come and learn from Gary and from many of his uh, entrepreneur friends. One of the, I think one of the most uh, exciting parts of, of that was always Gary's fireside chats. Um, and we wanted to use the same format here tonight to help all of you in the room hear from a very different kind of social entrepreneur. Uh, Gary runs a for-profit social venture, founded a for-profit social venture. Tonight we're going to hear from a, a non-profit uh, social entrepreneur, Sally Sampson. Um, Gary said something at the beginning, which was that, you know, if, if we can do it, you can do it. And that, that's definitely one of the big messages tonight, that, that social entrepreneurs come from everywhere. They look like all of you. Social entrepreneurial ideas come in weird and wonderful, from weird and wonderful places. Uh, the winner of our student track last year, uh, Alex Freed, many of you saw him win and uh, know his organization. I'm glad to report in the last year since he won the Social Venture Innovation Challenge, he has just gone from strength to strength. He was in his early 20s when he started his social venture. Gary talked about his journey. He was, I think I did the math right, he was in his early 30s when he started Stonyfield Farm. Uh, Sally Sampson, she gave me permission to say this, she was in her early 50s when she started her social venture. So truly social entrepreneurs can come from anywhere at any time. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Sally to be in a dialogue with Gary tonight. Um, I first met Sally about five years ago around her dining room table. She'd invited me and a couple of other, I hope smart women, uh, to give her some feedback. Gary said, "Get you know, test your ideas with people. And so she asked a friend to invite a few other friends that maybe knew something about social entrepreneurs and social ventures. And so she cooked us dinner, of course, and it was healthy and wonderful. Um, and she said, I have this kind of crazy idea. You know, I've been, I've, been a, I've been a cookbook author for basically most of my career. And she's been a very good cookbook author. Those of you that know Todd English, uh, she wrote many cookbooks with Todd English and many, many others. So she really knew about recipe development and about healthy eating and how to, and how to encourage people to, to become cooks, to become uh, home cooks, not, not chefs. But she was at a transition point in her life and she said, you know, I think I can do something more with this. I've enjoyed being a cookbook author, but I want to do something more and I want to have a, a social impact. And for Sally, that was to help address the incredible epidemic of obesity in this country. And I know she'll talk a lot more about that in a minute. So um, just, uh, I was very lucky to be asked to join Sally's advisory board and it's been a privilege to advise Sally over the last four or five years as she's really grown Chop Chop. Uh, this is the latest issue of, of Chop Chop. Uh, an incredible cooking magazine for kids and their families. Uh, it's now distributed to more than two million families annually, um, and she's won many, many awards uh, for, for Chop Chop, including probably the most prestigious, which is the James Beard Foundation's Award for Publication of the Year in 2013. So I can't be, couldn't be more proud of the work that Sally's done over the last four or five years, and I uh, want to welcome her here and invite her up to have a conversation with Gary. Thanks, Sally. Pretend there's a fire here. Yeah, so. I was wondering about that. <laughs> we'll just draw one. So, Sally doesn't like talking in front of audiences. Thanks. But you're talking to me right, right now. And as you'll hear, you'll understand in a moment why uh, th this is truly why Sally's a truly, Sally is one of my favorite entrepreneurs. I hope you've looked on your chairs to take a look through this absolutely brilliant, positive Publication. So let's start there. Tell me, tell us, tell me okay. your vision. What was the, what was the, what was the dream? What were you setting out to do? Well, so I was a cookbook writer, as you know, and I have a child who has a chronic illness, mm. and I she's now 22 and she's fine, but uh, she was on because of what she has, she was on a 5% fat diet, which is insanely low. So mm. I learned a lot about obesity, just in terms of trying to feed her. And I realized that I didn't want to write cookbooks anymore. I wanted to do something more meaningful. And uh, sort of people were starting to really pay attention to obesity. And I felt like I could use my skills as a cookbook writer 
to help address obesity by getting kids to cook. Mm. It sort of seemed like a big duh to me. But why a magazine? You tell us about Chop Chop. How, why this? Form? Well, I wanted, um, I thought that because pediatricians had so much gravitas, that pediatricians were also often the only constant in a kid's life other than their parents. I mean, if you think about it, really more so than teachers or anything like that. So my idea was that doctors would prescribe cooking to kids during well child visits, not just to obese kids, but to all kids. Mm -hmm. So had you done anything with magazine production before? I had before? just written uh, a couple of articles. I had no experience in the magazine industry or running a nonprofit. Okay, so so you're doing a nonprofit magazine and you've done neither. Right. So talk to us about the start. How like how, okay? So you have this idea and this need. So so actually, I really had no interest in starting my own business. Mm. I approached the um, chief of pediatrics at Boston Medical Center and. I didn't ask him to hire me, but that's actually, so it goes against what you said. I didn't ask him to hire me, so he didn't hire me. Mm. But my fantasy was that I would it, come up it with- It supports what I'm saying. Well, yes. You didn't ask I didn't, didn't ask happen. and I didn't get it. Right. <laughs> but he is on my board. Um, so I thought I would come up with this great idea and he would hire me and he would pay me to do it. But I didn't ask and he didn't do it. Mm. and. So I also couldn't decide, should I be a nonprofit? Should I be a for-profit? I really knew nothing about nonprofits. Well, just to back up a second, I mean, I'm curious. So you wanted to teach kids to cook, so why not teach? I mean, why oh, do this instead? Because I don't like speaking in front of groups. Okay, that's, that's <laughs> good. We got that. Um, and because my background was always, I was in a room alone writing yes. recipes and cooking on my own. Yes. That's, I don't really like to teach. Yeah. Maybe we should have backed up a second and explained. Maybe you could talk about your writing prior because I realize I, I know your history, right. but everyone here doesn't. So I was a cookbook writer and a magazine contributor. And at, by the time I launched Chop Chop, I'd probably written about 16 books. And I loved it. And I really am still doing that in many ways. I don't, that I just was developing recipes all the time and writing about them and every now and then sort of going a little bit off course. But I really wanted to keep doing what I was doing, mm -hmm. but do it in a way that was meaningful. Okay. So now you've t had the talk with the guy who didn't hire you. So what next? <laughs> so I decided to uh, form a nonprofit, and I did, and uh, really didn't know anything about raising money. But because my daughter has a, a not only a chronic illness, she has a very unusual illness. It's pancreatitis, mm -hmm. which is sort of unheard of in children. I knew like every gastroenterologist in Boston and I knew, you know, I just, because she was an oddity, so people were kind of interested in her. So I knew a ton mm. of people in the medical field and reached out to those people because obesity sort of lives in gastroenterology. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of snowballed. So the guy that didn't hire me did come on board and he wrote to all of his friends who were doctors and said, I'm involved in this. If we give it to you for free, Will you take it? For, but, but, um, am I I'm, skipping? A no, step? well, I, I'm still, I want to, because there's some folks here incubating ideas right now. I mean, <coughs> you formed a nonprofit because you then knew you were going to do a magazine? I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to get the how so did when it take I, this form. So, actually, when I went to Barry, the guy that didn't hire me, mm -hmm. I really just wanted to do like a pamphlet. Okay. And then it just started, as I talked to more and more people, it seemed like, well, I shouldn't really just have recipes. I should have gorgeous photographs, mm -hmm. and I should have games, and I should do a little bit on gardening. And so it seemed like once, it seemed like I went from a pamphlet to a magazine really quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now, now you're talking to medical people. So, so far, I still don't hear anybody in your world who knows anything about magazines. So. How, where did you get, uh, how'd you get the help? I did, uh, so I went to, uh, so one of my closest friends in high school, her older brother's best friend, who I, I had known, okay, but not really, because he was four years older, and you don't really hang out with people four years older in high school. He had been the editor, maybe of a section, but maybe of the whole Washington Post. Mm. 
And he had been at Men's Health hey, wait, before that? Wait, write this down. Older brother's best, <laughs> fr best friend's older brother. Critical resource here. Yeah. So I called him and said, I'm doing this magazine. Do you know someone who might be interested in being my editor? Mm. And he said, I would be. No. And I actually really didn't call him for that. And then I said to him, and I need a designer. And he said, I got a guy. And he brought in his designer, wow. neither of whom got paid, nor did I, for two or three issues. Mm. But um, so then I started the raising money part. And, and, and let's talk about that. OK. Well, how did you know even how much to raise? What? Well, initially, even though it was going to be a quarterly, it was, we were really just talking about one issue. So uh -huh. I went, so my daughter had been what's known as a frequent flyer at Children's Hospital Boston. Mm. So I went to them because I knew they couldn't say no to me. Mm -hmm. So I said, <laughs> um, I said, I'm starting this thing, blah, 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 blah. Would you come in as a sponsor? And mm. they said yes. And then they said, call uh, Children's Hospital of Arkansas and Children's Hospital Cincinnati, because we usually do stuff together, mm. and they'll be too embarrassed to say no, because mm. we said yes. Wow. This is the stone soup. Right. OK, we're getting a theme tonight, right. OK? And that worked really well. They all said yes. Wow. But I also, the amount that I asked them for was $2,000. I tried to come up with an amount of money that would be hard to say no to. Mm that just was like nothing for them. Mm -hmm. And it worked. So I used each one that I asked money from to sort of humiliate the next mm -hmm. one. And mm -hmm. of course, Stonyfield was my first mm -hmm. non-hospital sponsor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was, you know, a really big deal because it gave us, you know, like, oh, look. Oh, cred. Right. Yeah. So uh, at a very kind of tactical level for a moment, because again, we have some people about to walk off the gangplank. And I really mean that in the positive sense of the word. Um, how, how, seriously, how did you know how much money to raise? So you said 2000 because that, that was, you thought, an affordable ask. But what did you think you was, it was going to cost? And how, how did you even guess at it? I didn't. I had no game plan. And Fiona will tell you. I almost never have a game plan. She's always like, Sally, you know, you have to this. It's just not the way my brain works. Okay. My brain works inorganic in the other way. You know, I just I know I shouldn't be saying that in this group. Well, no, but let's let's pull let's follow the thread. So as it turns out, what did you raise and what did you need? So in hindsight. What I did was at, I, I thought I was going to raise, I don't know, some amount of money, and then I would decide to print. And then I just said, I'm just going to print with what I have. So nobody took a salary. I had a friend who was in the publishing business. He printed uh, mass market, uh, like crossword puzzles and the kind of stuff you get in airports mm -hmm. with all the bad food. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll, he didn't do it for free, but he said, I'll do all the doing for you. Mm. You sort of, I'll give you a really good price. So I sort of got all these different things and then just said, I have enough money to print 150,000 copies. And we went. Which was, the, how much money was that? Roughly? You know, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, okay. It was probably like $60,000, but when I started, wow. The price of each magazine was going to be like three dollars, mm -hmm. and the more money, the more volume, it kept going down. Unit, units, yep. Mm -hmm. Really, went down. I don't even remember mm -hmm. what it went down mm -hmm. to, but probably Affordable. like forty cents mm -hmm. a magazine, kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. So okay, uh, and and I'm I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of interpreting here, and you tell me where I'm okay. wrong. So here you have an idea. But certainly not a, a you know business plan or experience, and you know you're clearly leaping into this thing. So this is what I call supply sided, right? This is, you know, you perceived a demand, but this, but you had the idea. You right. you thought the world needed this. Um, so and you've gone into the creation of this thing, but now you've got sixty thousand copies or one hundred and fifty. One hundred fifty. Sorry. So what's the, so the talk to us about how it... Okay, so Barry had written to all his people and said, if we give it to you for free, will you take it? 
you know, will you try it out? And a hundred people being doctors, doctors all okay. doctors, ninety nine percent of the people were doctors for their doctors' offices or their patients. Or right, mm -hmm. but the idea was that they did not just leave it in the in the waiting room. They had to hand it to the family, mm -hmm. so either to the parent or to the kid, depending on the age mm -hmm. and all that. And so it was all hand. You know, this is what I think you should be doing. Mm -hmm. Of now the hundred and fifty, what? what? Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Of the hundred and fifty thousand copies that we printed, 142,000 were requested by doctors. Wow. The other 8,000 went into my, really? Why? Well, because in my world, the nutrition course was the one that the docs slept through. <laughs> well, that's you know? why they needed it. So, but they're perceiving, <laughs> in other words, they're treating obesity, they're seeing kids and they see this as a solution. Ah, so you've tapped into a need from the, the supplier, really. The yes, job. and at that time in Massachusetts, not every state, but I think now, the doctors w had to talk about healthy eating mm. and exercise. Mm -hmm. So they were mandated to do it. And when I, so I called all these different doctors and said, what do you think about this idea? And they all really liked it, except for the friend whose brother's friend became my editor, she was like, oh, it's not a good idea, nobody will do it. But literally every other doctor said, how fast can you do this? Oh. Because we're talking about healthy eating, but we don't know anything. Mm. So we need a tool. Mm -hmm. And of course it was free. Yes. And did you think about tapping them to help pay? Did that idea occur to you? It didn't because mm. very quickly, so after the first issue came out, well, let me just say, Right before the first issue came out, there was an article in the Boston Globe in the business section, which is really funny, since I had no business plan. Mm -hmm. You would have thought it would at least be in the food section. Mm -hmm. But a business article came out, and then, so I got all these calls from other kinds of and businesses. How, that, that didn't just happen. Did, did somebody just heard about you and called I don't from know the, Globe? the writer. Uh -huh. um, I think it was just sort of somebody knew somebody and mm -hmm. she heard about it and we were in the process of being printed. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, this is a matter of you creating surface area by all the people you've been talking to. You weren't asking, but you kind of were asking. Yeah. You're doing it in your Sally way. Yes. Yes, I get it. <laughs> and uh, so, okay, so walk us through. So, so you've got 142,000, you've raised this 60,000 bucks, you've got 150,000 copies. You've clearly tapped into a need. There, the docs want more. What, what happened next? What's so what happened when the article came out was Indian reservations contacted us, food mm. banks contacted mm. us, schools, after schools, et cetera, et cetera. So the, we, I very quickly said, okay, my business model is no longer doctors. It's wherever children mm. are found. So that's who we're going to try to get to. And so mm. our whole thing was teach kids to cook real food, period. That's our mission. So we, everything, it's very easy to wrap everything into, you know, does this fit our mission? It's, because it's so succinct, it's yeah. so clear. Yeah, yeah. So pe more and more people started to find out about us and then we started to sell copies. So by the second copy, Philadelphia came in and bought sort of, um, Philadelphia, you mean uh, schools? Schools, but it was, uh, a lot of the money came from the USDA, mm -hmm. um, who gives money to states to get educational materials. Mm -hmm. And it was going into cooperative extension sent offices. Mm -hmm. So that came in, that was 45,000 copies that were paid for. Wow, imagine that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, so the, then the American Academy of Pediatrics came in and endorsed us, mm. which was huge. Mm -hmm. So getting endorsement from the American Academy of Pediatrics, they vet everything. We also had this unbelievable board of directors and advisors, sort of a real who's who. So started to get like serious. Cred. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, still nobody's being paid? Uh, at that point, I, I think mean, by the third issue we were being paid, and when I say we were being paid, I mean twenty thousand dollars a year. Yes, sure, sure, right. sure, sure. And uh, okay, so help. I want to get to the impediments in a, in a moment, but just for everybody here, so take us through from there to now. So okay. Three issues, and where are we now? So now we're uh, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary 
the next issue in the spring. We now print about three quarters of a million copies. Mm -hmm. We do 11 custom versions. So like what we did for Philly, we now do in Arkansas, Oklahoma. We do it for um, Rutgers. We do it for New Balance, who's our lead sponsor. We, do, we have uh, Chop Chop in Spanish. We have a custom one in Philadelphia Spanish. So we've really become a content company. We do um, recipe cards. We, do, we did a cookbook. We do content. And we actually license our recipes to other people. Um, we're we're $1.2 million this year. Mm. And you're paying for yourselves? Yes. OK. How many people, by the way? Well, Patty, who's right back there, is my first full-time employee. She's the executive director. And what I always used is people would always say I was the executive director. And I thought, that is so funny, because nobody would hire me to be an executive director. Mm -hmm. But I have um, a, like three people in the office who kind of have mommy hours. And then we have a photographer and a uh, stylist and a creative director and an editor who are more episodic. Mm -hmm. So again, just to, to sort of cut to the chase here and, and frame this for a lot of the interest here. So you had a clear mission uh, and a clear need that you tapped into. Um, so, and of course money is the challenge, right? Raising the money, but you basically used the kind of word of mouth slash guilt tripping approach to fundraising, right? Which, by the way, works great. <laughs> I'm, I applaud. Um, but seriously, what t t talk to us about the impediments. I mean, what were, and, 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 and I invite you also to just from a personal point of view, I mean, this is your baby. And you're doing this because you started from a place, so this is about your kid. And mm -hmm. so what, what were you running into here on, on a kind of a... Well, what did you say that uh, peop that entrepreneurs are, are social innovators are pathological? Right. Yeah. So I am really pathologically optimistic. Yeah. I okay. almost never think when I'm doing something of what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. It's like never. And so I sort of just. Ready, fire, aim. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I'm still doing that five years later. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, all these custom copies, we're probably. I don't know the numbers. What do you think? 75% self-sustaining? Uh -huh. So f we are not, we are a magazine, but we're not really a magazine because we have this very clear Custom. mission. And we give about 50% of our copies away for free to those uh, most at risk or in need. Mm -hmm. And we... So essentially the payers are covering the cost of the print run. Correct. So, and then and that enabling your unit costs to be low so you're generating surplus that you can then use to fulfill your mission. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I might as well tell you the numbers. We charge for custom copies uh, $1.35 a copy. copy. The incremental cost to us is 18 cents. Mm -hmm. So right. that's serious. I mean, we are actually going to be profitable this year, which we're really not supposed to be. But um, because we've brought in so much. And I think that... Um, but so we're a nonprofit, but we don't really act just like a nonprofit because we sell so much. Yeah. I believe that's the ultimate growth yes. of it. It's not sexy because it's paper. And let me just address the paper thing because Please. you probably think that's horrible. But um, we, uh, we are also digital, but because so many of the kids that we reach are low income. Yeah. It's, number one, they don't have an iPad that they're going to take into the kitchen with them. And what we've been told over and over and over again is that the low-income kids never get anything beautiful. Mm. You know, they get a mm. Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox. And mm -hmm. so for them to have, you guys probably don't know what Xerox is, uh, a copy of a copy of a copy. Um, you know, this beautiful paper that's beautifully photographed. The kids look like, our kids are very diverse in every way. They're every color you can imagine. They're every size you can imagine. They're in wheelchairs. They have braces. You know, it's, the idea is that any kid can look at it and see themselves in the magazine. Mm -hmm. So, so again, and I want to get to some of your questions in just a moment, but, uh, so you, your answer to my question about what were the impediments was that I don't think about what can go okay, wrong. Okay, money. But, but what? Money. So raising money. And how have you, so how, how have you addressed it? Because that. 
it's is really probably going to be a problem with others here, I would guess. So, um, so my attitude is you can always get more money. Um, and I think it's selling copies, you know, has really made a difference. Um, I'm very scrappy. So you see, I have my first full-time person. We don't spend any money that we don't have to. I mean, so it's, uh, you know, not a penny is wasted. Like, so the, the magazine, so I had a, a meeting with our uh, publisher, not our published, uh, our printer. And originally the magazine was one eighth of an inch by one quarter of an inch bigger than this. So after like five or six issues, she said to me, you know, you could reduce your cost by 10% if you trim the magazine to a more standard size. Well, because I knew nothing about the magazine business, I didn't know that we weren't a standard size. Mm -hmm. So I was like, trim it. And she said, you could also, our paper was originally heavier. And she said, you could trim another 10%. And it was also brighter white. It's a pretty bright white and it's pretty heavy. So I did each of those things not at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, like we've looked at postage, we've looked at every single thing you can imagine. What can we cut and keep the same quality? Mm -hmm. So I don't think those three things that we did changed the quality at all. So one is I'm really scrappy, I don't waste any money, and I go out and ask people for money. And as you know, I'm relentless. Yes. Well, yeah, you're, yeah, it's ironic that you say I don't like asking because you've been pretty good with me. Um, uh, but don't tell me I said that. So um, I'm going to turn to you all for some questions, but I'm going to just get you ready to, I'm going to put you on the spot before we end at the end so you can be thinking, you know, what's the, what's the piece of advice? What's the nugget? You know, there's another Sally Sampson here. What? What would you tell that Sally five years ago? And just think about that for a couple of minutes. But let's get your, your questions uh, right here. Yeah. Sally, did you ever think about um, doing a for-profit? I did. And actually, a lot of people have come to me and said, you should be for-profit, I'll invest. And it never seems quite right. Um, I think that if I had started out as a for-profit, the American Academy of Pediatrics would never have endorsed me. I don't think I would have been taken as seriously. I do think I could change now if I wanted to, but I think I needed to be a nonprofit to start. Do you think, well, this by extension, what about now? As you look... Do I wish I had done it differently? No, uh, looking, looking forward. I, so the, here's the great thing about being a nonprofit. I don't have to please anyone. I don't have to worry about making money for anyone. I, all I think about is, am I, is what I'm doing teaching kids to cook and eat real food? Great answer. And I have a board that is worse, you know, they're even more like, are you getting to enough poor kids? Are you getting to enough? I mean, so the board is on mission and that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm. No. I mean, no, not at all. I just thought it seemed obvious. That's a fabulous answer because that is often what happens. I just have to editorialize. The world was not screaming for organic yogurt in 1983. And probably there's 25 ideas in this room that the world may not be screaming for, but it doesn't mean that the idea is wrong. Uh, let me just also say that when I started, so it was before Obama was in the White House, meaning it was before Mrs. Obama had launched Let's Move, and people said to me, obesity? Like, who cares about obesity? Mm. And then when I started, people said, cooking? What, what does cooking have to do with it? Mm. And now, five years later, everybody's talking about cooking. Yeah, that's true. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. And how do you say chop chop in Spanish? <laughs> it's called chop chop in Spanish. Um, but that's a good question, and I don't know the answer, but I should find out. Um, how did I arrive at the name? We 
had this long, 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 long list of names, and none of them felt right. And then just one day I said, chop, chop. And the, everybody loved it. Except for two. Yeah, well, there's so many meanings to it. There's so many right. meanings to it. Other, other questions or comments for Sally? Yes, sir. That's right. Right. Yeah, the issue, there's actually very specific tax uh, regs on this that uh, your percentage of revenue um, can, has to be below a certain threshold of, of earned revenue from selling, but but, uh, but as long as you're redistributing, and you're, you're absolutely right. I was going to comment yeah. on that. L l last question or two, and then I'm going to put you on the spot with the question I asked you. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Jeff. Yeah. And, and I think because if we're talking about social, um, social mission uh, companies and entrepreneurs, this debate whether or not to go to nonprofit mm -hmm. or profit or, or a B Corp or something is really important. Uh, so kind of tell us what the advantage of being the nonprofit for. Where do, you, do you see some advantage of saying, hey, I wish I was a for profit, or now I'm thinking about being a for profit? I think the advantage of being, in my case, but I don't really care about this, so I'm just going to tell you. I think the advantage would be if I wanted to sell it, I would have something to sell. And right as a for, as a nonprofit, you don't. Great answer. Yeah. Any other? Yes. So you can remedy like if your proceeds are higher than they should. Costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can remedy that by giving away more free magazines. Right? Or oh, building an endowment. Right. But so okay. what I always say is the more money we bring in, the more magazines we give away. Right. So it's kind of great. Yeah. So, Gary, I think we should. Okay. Sally's so what, what would you tell the Sally Sampson of five years ago or the next uh, social entrepreneur here? What's your, what's, you got any nuggets? I would say do what you love. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do what you love and do what you care about. You know, what you were saying is if you say you have a social mission that you don't mean, people know. And I think it's really true. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that's a fabulous answer. And uh, what I would encourage all of you to do is take, take this amazing product home. To, if you have any kids, share the wealth here. This is, I, I just think, one of the, the great things going. And... Again, this is somebody who saw something well before it was time, but now it's time has you know, arrived. So please join me in uh, thanking Can I say Sally. one more thing? Yes, sure. So I just want to say one thing about the obesity so epidemic. <laughs> is that almost everybody's doing negative messaging. Is saying you're bad, you're fat, you don't eat right. We don't do any of that. It's only positive. Yeah, we don't true. say, we have no negative messaging and we sort of are opposed to negative messaging. And I think that's part of why people like it. Yeah, well said, well said. Well, join me in thanking Sally. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.